I am recording now. And now it's time for the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now, Big Anklevich. Please. And Rish Outfield. Don't ever kiss me again. Yo, yo, welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Yeah, this is Big Anklevich coming at ya. And I'm DJ Rish Outfield. Oh, ho, ho. in the house. In the his house. I almost said his house. I knew I couldn't pull it off. <laughs> welcome, everybody. To another episode of our fine cultural show. Yes, jolly good. What episode is it today? Uh, today's episode is episode 98 in our catalogue. Ah, very good. I guess I've already told you I'm Rish Outfield. How is everybody today? Oh, really? Okay, well, thanks for participating. I don't think they participated. I think they just ignored you. That's all right. That's that. that's what you're supposed to do when jerk-offs try and get you to do some kind of audience participation, though, isn't it? You know, when you go to the theater and you're sitting there and all of a sudden the players all start walking down on these stairs and they start coming out into the audience and they're walking down the aisle and you're like, ah, fourth wall. I took my niece to see Sweeney Todd and Uh at the end of the play, the chorus comes out and they're all they're all dead because pretty much everybody in Sweeney Todd dies by the end of that play. And the chorus comes out and they're all dressed as ghosts or specters. Or maybe they were always dressed that way. But I didn't realize it until the end. Uh-huh. And at the end, they all sing the Sweeney Todd song again. And, and it's like, you know, Sweeney is coming up behind and they go there and they point at somebody in the audience. There! And that freaked the hell out of my niece. Just that they would point at the audience and, and there he is, you know, uh, kind of thing. Really, really cool. I, I enjoyed the play much more than the film. All right. We're talking. Yeah, we're, we're not, not supposed, supposed to, to be, be talking about that kind of stuff. That was supposed to just be a quick aside. Well, hey, it's, you know, it's my show, and as long as I'm on the show, uh, we I can do whatever the hell I want. Oh, is that how it is? Yeah, that's how it is. Yeah, you want to change something? You want to make something of it? Wow, you're really getting into this Tupac Why attitude Why don't you tell here. me what the episode is called? <laughs> today's boy. episode, today's episode, homie, is Tupac Shakur and the End of the World by Sandra McDonald. Well, I don't know Sandra McDonald. Uh, what do you know about her? Well, her work has appeared in Asimov, Strange Horizons, Realms of Fantasy, and several other magazines and anthologies, including Shape Magazine, in a bikini a long time ago. She's a graduate of Scenic Ithaca College and the University of Southern Maine, where she studied with great writers, including James Patrick Kelly and Dennis Lehane. She has a collection of her short fiction called Diana Comet and Other Improbable Stories. Her novels The Outback Stars, The Stars Down Under, and The Stars Blue Yonder are about an Australian military lieutenant, her handsome sergeant, and their adventures in deep space. Today's story first appeared in Futurismic in March of 2010. Tupac Shakur and the End of the World by Sandra MacDonald The worst part, well, one of the worst parts disregarding the collapse of modern civilization is that it was my own stupid choice to leave Florida in the first place and here I am spending my last days trying to get back there. I don't have the creep yet, but let's not pretend I'm special or mysteriously immune. I'm not the plucky heroine of a summer blockbuster who will find true love. Shaggy-haired Brendan Fraser would be nice, or Daniel Craig with his icy blue eyes. And then become matriarch of a community of ragtag survivors. I'm just me, Susan Donahue, 31, former textbook writer, currently hiking down I-95 in North Carolina armed with a 45 handgun, pepper spray, and a hunting knife. I won't let anyone touch me. Let's not pretend, either, that I'm on anything but a fool's errand. My sister Marie, her husband Mike, and my baby niece Monica are probably already dead. Best I'll be able to do is just bury them. Take their hardened, creepified bodies and put them in the dirt, then drop down beside them. With me on this southbound hike are Lazy Lamar, Crazy Chris, Tipsy Tina, and Jumpin' Jack. 
The alliterative nicknames were Tina's idea. Some trick she used to do as an icebreaker when she used to teach equal opportunity seminars in Baltimore. The only one I really trust is Jumpin' Jack. He and I left Brooklyn 18 days ago. He's a lot like Brendan Fraser, except gay. He wants to die in Miami. Only 830 miles to South Beach. He says as we pass signs for Rocky Mount. He's got a map and a handheld GPS that only works sporadically. The weather is overcast and cold this October day, maybe 50 degrees. Oh, I really hope it doesn't snow. How many to Savannah? Asks Lazy Lamar, who may be too lazy to do math, but who does a lot of other hard work for our hardy group. 353. Jack replies patiently. Crazy Chris spits out some chewing tobacco. I'm only going as far as Charleston. Ask me what I dislike most about Chris, and I won't have to think hard. The jaw is pretty high on the list, and the fact that he stares at me when he thinks I'm sleeping. And when he pisses by the side of the road, he likes to hold himself a lot longer than I think is necessary. He won't say what his pre-apocalypse job was, though I have some guesses that may or may not include prison yards. On the plus side, he has a good sense of survival and no compunctions about rummaging through the stalled or crashed cars we pass on the highway. Some traffic passes, a tow truck, green Nissan, a Honda with its rear end crushed in, but no one stops for us. If you think interstates are boring at 70 miles an hour, try walking the mile after mile and discover the true meaning of tedium. Occasionally, Jack and Lamar play word games or Chris will tell body jokes or Tina will sneak a gulp of whiskey from her hip flask. She says she is going to Orlando to find her grandparents, but she doesn't actually know their address. I think she joined us only because she felt grateful to have people to talk to and a goal to pursue. Lamar is sweet on her. He always makes sure she eats and drinks before he does, and they lay side by side each night, close enough to whisper but not accidentally touch each other. Smoke, Lamar says, gazing past a billboard toward the west. I have a portable radio and extra batteries, but it's too depressing to listen to what's left of local newscasts. It doesn't matter anymore what burns or blows up or falls into the sea. What matters is finding a cure to the creep, which isn't going to happen unless somewhere there's a top-secret laboratory of doctors and scientists toiling away on generator power and Red Bull bullied and motivated by an idiosyncratic scientist a lot like Ed Harris. The smoke thickens and billows into the sky, reeking of burning plastic and overheated metal. We keep walking. We're not the only pedestrians along the highway, but singles and groups all give each other wide berth. At the next exit, we overtake a Ford Taurus station wagon with the engine off and the windows rolled up, and an elderly Spanish woman in the driver's seat. Chris sees plastic grocery sacks in the back seat and smashes in the windows. The car smells like urine and excrement, but not the sour tang of death. Pineapple, beans, more pineapple. Chris divvies up the canned goods, ignores the rest, passes them to us carefully, doesn't toss. He moves the driver outside. Her joints don't flex, which makes it difficult, and tries the ignition and gas. The tank is run dry. So, we keep walking, Jack says, ever the optimist. He rummages through the back and finds two flashlights. We always need flashlights. Tina opens the glove compartment and pulls out the registration. Lucida Gonzalez, she says softly. Thank you, Lucida. After the others trudge away, Chris takes Lucida's hat from her tiny, wrinkled head and holds it over her mouth and nose for a few minutes. She doesn't buck or jerk or protest in any way. She can't. When he's sure she's out of her misery, he pulls the gold cross from her neck and gives it to me. I jam it into my pocket. Later, it'll join a collection of other trinkets in my backpack. When we get to Jacksonville, I'm going to build a little monument next to the grave I dig for Marie and Mike and the baby Monica. A memorial. Or at least the only memorial I can provide to all the victims of this plague. It's not stealing from the dead, technically. We're all dead. Some of us just haven't stopped moving yet. Get it? Moving? The creep? Post-apocalyptic humor is very sardonic. I said I wrote textbooks. Not exactly. 
Mostly, I wrote junior high level biographies of famous people for a school publisher called Revere House. Maybe you read my insightful volumes about Angela Merkel or Pope Benedict. My last book was about warrior poet mogul Tupac Shakur, tragically killed at the age of 25. I learned a lot about hip hop and rap while writing that book. One of the hardest projects I ever took on was co writing a medical textbook. The primary author was by a doctor in Hawaii whose writing skills had been eroded by too many years baking on the beach. In a chapter about genetic disorders, he wrote about FOD, fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva, which is when your body starts to respond to scrapes and bruises in a seriously bad way. Muscles, tendons, and other things that hold you together start turning to bone. You get ossified. The process takes years, though. FOD starts at the top of your head and works down toward your feet. It's the same way a fetus grows bones. Mix FOD with the characteristics of a fast-moving virus and you get something like the creep. At the beginning of the plague, it took about a week from the triggering injury until a body locked up in stony paralysis. The condition spread like wildfire from wherever the initial scrape, bruise, or bump occurred. Now the creep only takes a day or two to freeze you up. If the creep is a virus, though, it's a bug that debuted simultaneously around the globe during the second week of March and can't be identified in water supplies, in sealed air supplies, in corpses. Astronauts on the space station got it. They're still up there orbiting, long dead. Military men on nuclear submarines got it, even the ones who deployed months ago. Those subs are now just floating tombs adrift and unseen beneath the dark seas. Jumpin' Jack brought along a paperback copy of Stephen King's The Stand when we left Brooklyn. He says that at least with The Creep, you don't get the snot and phlegm of King's fictional superflu. After that, he read Lucifer's Hammer, about a giant comet or asteroid hitting the Earth. The upside of The Creep is that it doesn't obliterate large land masses. In a bookstore outside D.C., he picked up Cormac McCarthy's The Road, but it was a big disappointment disaster-wise, because McCarthy wimped out and doesn't identify whatever cataclysm ruined the world. After one long conversation, Jack and Chris agree that their favorite disaster movie is that Dennis Quaid one about the sudden freezing of the globe. I think I have a copy somewhere in one of the unpacked moving boxes in my closet back in Brooklyn. Brooklyn, right. I forgot to say that writing books about German prime ministers and tragically murdered hip-hop stars can be done from just about anywhere. I'd only wound up in Florida because I'd finished my master's degree at Cornell, wanted to live somewhere warm for a change, and Marie had a spare bedroom while she finished her internship at Riverside Hospital in Jacksonville. Our parents had moved from Ohio to Oregon. I think of them now as stone statues in Mom's Rose Garden holding each other's hands. A few months after I moved in with Marie, she met Mike. Several months later, they married. Then Mike's sperm got frisky with one of her eggs. To be truthful, the friskiness occurred before the wedding, but Mom and Dad don't know that. And I was going to be an aunt, and anywhere in the Northeast started to look like a good option. I can't say that I picked New York City because of Tupac, but I did think it would be helpful to visit some of the places where he and his mother had lived when he was a kid. Greenwich Village in the East Bronx. Got to one, not the other. Time ran out, a book was due, the usual excuses. Sorry, Pac. Anyway, Jack carries around his post-apocalyptic novels and is on constant lookout for rape gangs, drunken marauders, escaped lunatics, and other dangers at the end of the world. To be truthful, most people are already dead or hunkered down somewhere trying their best not to get scraped, bruised, or bumped. Meanwhile, I've been reading survival guides. The worst case survival handbook, while dryly amusing, has not proven to be helpful yet. We haven't had to jump onto moving vehicles or escape from unexpected patches of quicksand. The SAS Survival Guide Pocket Version has a section on knots, and I practice them in my mind at night when I can't sleep. Triple bowling, bowling on the bite, man harness hitch. Someday we might need to pitch a tent, and everyone will be impressed with my handy skills. There are sections in both books about moving the injured, but not about burying the dead. Marie and I are the same height. Mike's maybe four inches taller. Baby Monica is almost a year old. I don't know her height or weight. Marie and I didn't talk much after I moved, and not at all since Christmas. I had a new life to lead. She had a new life to birth and feed and burp and love, and she had Mike. Ten miles outside of Selma, North Carolina, 
Tipsy Tina trips and goes down hard on one knee. Maybe it's the whiskey. Maybe just a pothole or a twisted piece of tire rubber or something thrown in her path by the fickle finger of fate. Lazy Lamar tells her it'll be fine. By dinner, though, there's an angry red knot on her kneecap. By morning, her foot, knee, and hip are locked into place. Tina's crying when she asks us to shoot her. We're not shooting anyone, Lamar replies. But that's the deal we all made in abandoned Starbucks in Baltimore. No questions asked, no false hope, just a bullet between the eyes once paralysis kicks in. Jack and Chris are standing nearby awkwardly, hands in their pockets, while Lamar and Tina talk in low whispers. I'm already a dozen feet away, distant, distanced. I'm thinking of Tupac, blissfully ignorant of his impending death. He was sitting in a car in Las Vegas when someone pulled up and fired a dozen bullets through the window. Cops never caught his killer. You could say that Tina at least has the comfort of knowing her killer. That's really a comfort. Whoever pulls the trigger, the real villain is her own body gone haywire, mutating beyond control because of a virus or some secret weapon from space aliens or Mother Nature finally giving up on the human race. Lamar and Tina kiss. Then he asks Chris to do the dirty deed. Chris's gun hand doesn't waver. It starts to rain. Lamar has a portable shovel he's been carrying since New Jersey, and we dig Tina a shallow grave. Her short, dark hair is a mess when she goes into the muddy ground. I comb it out before the dirt gets filled back in. Afterward, in true apocalyptic fashion, we divvy up the contents of her backpack. At the bottom, wrapped in a blue dish towel, is a wedding photo. Tina and her husband. He looks a little like my brother-in-law, Mike. I peel the picture out of the frame and add it to my souvenir collection. How do you feel? Jack asks me later. And that's a crazy question. Who feels anything these days? Besides, he knows I probably won't answer. Since Brooklyn, I haven't had the urge to speak much. My nickname is Silent Susan. Jumpin' Jack is one of the first people I met when I moved north. His apartment was downstairs from mine. He was our building's welcome wagon, always ready to share advice on the best pizza places, where to go for fresh produce, how to get the most out of our cranky old thermostats. Winter was one of Marie's arguments before I left. You'll hate the cold, she predicted. I lived in Ithaca, I told her. New York's Finger Lakes region in winter is not exactly balmy. It's different when you get old. For my 31st birthday, Jack took me to a midnight showing of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. The crowd sang and danced, but I felt curiously listless, even during the toilet paper scene. Later, Jack told me I needed a boyfriend. If I wanted a boyfriend, I replied, I could have stayed in Jacksonville. Well, to be fair... Nothing happened between Mike and me after Marie got pregnant. And it wasn't as if they were dating exclusively before that. Marie was busy all the time with her internship. I was home all the time working on Angela Merkel. One night, Mike came over for Scrabble night. Marie got stuck working late, and Mike kissed me after I landed seven letters on a triple word score. A week ago, in a minivan back in Virginia, three kids in the back seat, all of them very dead. Crazy Chris found a travel Scrabble set. Tina was a good player, but got so drunk she passed out over her tiles. Lamar tried his best, but he can't spell. Jack gave up halfway through so he could crawl into his sleeping bag with Stephen King. I won. But against an alcoholic and a dyslexic, it was sort of an empty triumph. A lot of post-apocalyptic victories are. As everyone knows, one of the best things about disaster movies is watching the various characters meet their tragic fates. Tornadoes suck office workers out of buildings in Dennis Quaid's movie. Jack and I laughed at that one one night on HBO. A ferry of frightened evacuees tips over in Tom Cruise's movie, and that was a lot of fun, too. Will Smith's New York movie was mostly dull. But the other one, where he and Jeff Goldblum save humanity by uploading a computer virus to the alien spaceship, there's a great scene where all of these people are gathered on top of the building and the aliens blow it up. Awesome special effects. 
If there's a hip-hop movie being filmed in the afterlife, I can easily see Tupac leading the heroic survivors after an alien invasion or volcano eruption or whatever. And the notorious B.I.G. will be there, too, and the soundtrack would be something I'd never listen to, but which will make a lot of money if, you know, they have a post-existence iTunes store. Watching a disaster movie is, unfortunately, much better than living one. After Tina's fall, we are all very careful not to become the next expendable character. We don't touch anything unless it's absolutely necessary. We walk slower. We never run. North Carolina goes on forever and forever, and I realize this is my purgatory, walking back to a place I never should have left. But finally, we find an abandoned black Ford escape by the side of the road. The key is still dangling from the ignition. Crazy Chris drives. It's soothing being in a car after so many days on foot. The leather seats smell new, and there's plenty of room for all four of us. The iPod attached to the radio contains a great collection of country music, which, I have to admit, I grew to like down in Florida. I'm dozing to the sounds of Kenny Chesney when Chris says, Roadblock. As far as roadblocks go, it's not much. A few parked patrol cars, some sand barrels, and a bunch of traffic cones stretching across the southbound lanes. There's only one state trooper on duty. He's sitting on the ground with his back against a barrel and a rifle in his lap. From a distance, he looks like Robert Downey Jr. in his younger years. From the unnatural way he's sitting, I'm sure he has the creep. You can run right over those cones. Lamar says from the back seat. I wouldn't. Jack says. They might be full of grenades or spikes. I don't know what crazy book he's been reading lately that he thinks someone would stuff grenades in traffic cones. But Chris stops the SUV. Be careful. He says, Susan and Lamar, you move those cones. Jack, come with me. The cones are not booby-trapped, and I'm glad. As Lamar and I move them, I hear part of the conversation with Trooper Robert Downey. Orders from the governor. The trooper insists. The governor's probably dead. Jack says with some compassion. You've got to know that. No. Evacuated. The trooper forces out. It's pretty obvious he can't lift his arms or hands. Government lab, Stone Mountain. Stone Mountain sounds pretty familiar to me, though I'm not sure why. He's delirious. Chris spits out some tobacco and gets to his feet. Sorry, buddy. The trooper gasps out. Doc, maybe we should... Jack says, then shrugs. You know, help him. Help him by killing him now. I bend down next to the trooper. He can't move anything but his eyes. I make the mistake of looking at them, blue, green, and small. They look tired after so many endless hours focused on the empty road. There's a gold badge on his left chest, and I slowly unpin it from his sweaty shirt to add to my souvenirs. I'm sorry. I tell him. His eyes narrow. His right hand twitches. The rifle discharges. In the split second it takes to strike its target, I'm thankful that the barrel isn't aimed at any of us. But the bullet hits one of the roadblock cars in a way that isn't accidental or bad luck. The trooper planned this. Following orders to the end, and his rifle is strategically aimed at a car full of jugs of gasoline. The blast wave from the fiery explosion throws us all to the ground. Metal and glass shrapnel drive into flesh, asphalt, the SUV. Thick black smoke curls out of dark red flames. A friend of mine who worked at the Kennedy Space Center said that once, while she was pregnant, she was in her building when the space shuttle launched. The enormous sound wave made her unborn daughter start kicking and flailing. That's what I feel like now, that the sound is reverberating through all my muscle and bones, that I'm twisting helplessly in a dark prison, even though I can still feel the sun on my face. And that's it. No judicious or well-paced killing off of minor characters until only the principles remain for the final climax. End of my story. Except, it's not. When I come back to my senses, Chris is dead. Lamar's not dead, but he's got a broken right arm and that's not going to end well. I've got cuts, scrapes, and bruises on the back of my head, my right hip, back of my left ankle. Of us all, Jumpin' Jack is the only one who isn't hurt. He's ashen and shell-shocked, but not hurt. I don't want to die. Lamar says, breathing shallow, eyes wide with panic. You're not going to die. Jack says, empty promise, false hope. I turn over on the debris-strewn asphalt, trying to wrestle the rifle from the deputy. Susan, no! Jack snatches the rifle away. Stone Mountain! He said there's a lab! 
I sagged to the ground, head pillowed on my arms. I'm trying not to choke on the smoke or grief. We're 300 miles from Jacksonville. Chris is splayed out on the pavement, blood underneath him, hands and face relaxed. One side of his head is charred and there's a piece of torn steel embedded in the back of his neck. The trooper's eyes are open, but he's not moving either. How far to Stone Mountain? Lamar asks. Jack fetches his GPS, fiddles with it, slaps the side of it, squints. It's outside Atlanta. 280? No. I croak out. Jacksonville. They overrule me. To hell with them both. I grab my backpack. It's too early to feel the ossification, but my body does seem slower already, beginning to mutate. And limp past the burning barricade. Half a mile down the road, there's another blockade, and this one's no joke. Rows of National Guard tanks, all of them empty in the bright sun, and behind the tanks are hundreds, if not thousands of cars in both lanes that had tried to flee from Point South. Locked inside are stone bodies baking in the sun. Moms and dads and kids and little babies in car seats, some more dead than others. Jack and Lamar are waiting for me when I return. Atlanta. Jack says, and helps me into the still serviceable SUV. You can hold out. I wipe my face dry and fasten my seatbelt. Interstate 20 leads from Florence to Atlanta on a straight shot west. It's more crowded than 95 was, however. Abandoned cars, car accidents, tow trucks left standing with the driver's door still open. Bodies in driver's seats, bodies on the road, statues. There are dogs, too. Hungry, panting mutts, domestic animals going wild. Back in North Carolina, Chris and Lamar had taken turns scaring them off with the guns. Now Jack focuses on the driving, and we keep the windows rolled up. It's not a fast trip. Dark comes on. Curled up in the passenger seat, I flex my legs and arms, try to stay limber. Surely I can stave off the symptoms through exercise. But near midnight, I realize I can't turn my head anymore. And I think I cry out. <gasps> Jack's hand fumbles for mine. It's okay. He says. We're getting closer. Shoot me. I beg. Jack, please. His face is grim. No. Lamar in the back falls silent. Jack stops to siphon gas. Later he stops to sleep a little because he's nodding off with fatigue. I stare out the windshield at the stars. Dawn comes with perfect pink skies and the world is silent except for our breathing and the occasional yelp of dogs. My right arm is frozen at the elbow, my left leg numb and immobile. Lamar has frozen into place in the back seat, able to flex only his knees and elbows a little. Kill me. I tell Jack when he wakes. You promised. No, listen. Do you hear that? It's a single-engine plane. First plane I've heard in two weeks. Jack leaps outside and tries to flag it down. He's probably thinking like I am. Plane, radio, lab, doctors, Ed Harris, the antidote. The plane flies by us. No circling or dipping of its wings. I'm sure he saw us. Jack says. He's scruffy and bloodshot, clothes all wrinkled, but his chin is high. Hope has built him up. We're on the right path. He starts driving. Lamar is silent now. My own paralysis is exhausting me. Elbows and knees and ankles rapidly growing useless. Neck and shoulders won't move. My fingers flex, but just barely. Jack. I beg. The word unclear. So this is what it's like to feel again. The hot red sting of humiliation. The bottomless dropping sensation of helplessness and despair. I have never wanted anything more in my life than to die. We're almost there, he says. And then, miraculously, we really are there. Stone Mountain, Georgia. The town is named after the giant hunk of granite that rises out of the countryside like a secret fortress. My vision is slowly going, but I can see traffic signs for a state park, a sky lift, a visitor center. Some residents or local tourists are sitting outside, frozen into place on benches or blankets. Others lay in unmoving heaps on the stairs of a church. One elderly woman in a gray skirt and white pearls is leaning like an askew statue against a bus stop. The town is quiet as Jack rolls down the windows and idles the engine. Nothing. Yeah. I mumble. Lifting my tongue is hard. 
The tissue underneath is turning to bone, calcifying my jaw. He said so. Jack whispers. There has to be. He honks the horn several times in an SOS pattern. He steps out onto the road and shouts for help. I want to close my eyes, but my lids won't move anymore. On my side of the SUV is another sign for a tourist attraction, and I blink at it several times. I'm sure I'm hallucinating. When Jack comes back, I try to get him to look at it. He mistakes my agitation for worry about the mysterious lab and miraculous cure. We'll find someone, I promise. He says. Who? Ah. I say. And that's pretty much the last word I ever speak. Jack sees the sign. After a long moment with his hands clenched to the wheel, he starts driving again. And now I'm here with you, Pac. I wrote about it, but I didn't remember the name. The Tupac Shakur Foundation headquarters in Stone Mountain, replete with an art center and a peace garden. It's pretty far from where you died and not at all where I wanted to end up, but here in post-apocalypse world, we take what we can get. Jack has put me here in the shade by your bronze statue. He's sitting right beside me, crying. Here's the truth. I don't like hip hop. Never did. I don't even like you. The Malcolm X stuff, your partying and guns, the charges of sexual assault. There is not a lot we have in common. But your book paid the rent for a few months in Brooklyn. I sent a copy of it to Marie for Christmas, just as a joke, since she hates your music. She sent it back. Inside the cover, she wrote, I don't want this in the same house as my daughter. And I got so mad, I didn't call her until the creep started. The phone rang and rang, but no one answered. Life is short, Pac. I should have known that. Should have learned that from you. Susan? Jumpin' Jack says now, his voice soft. His eyes are still watery, but his face is calm as he raises the pistol. I guess I have to do this now. Just then, a white government van whips into the driveway and stops with a squeal of brakes. Men in hazmat suits jump out. Rescuers. Their leader looks just like Hed Harris. He's talking quickly, words that I barely catch. You just got here in time. We'll help you. We have a cure. And then I'm in a military infirmary. Voices and blurred images swirling around me. The heart monitor beeping like a hip-hop song. And then one of the white garb doctors turns out to be Marie with Mike and happy baby Monica at her side. And we laugh and laugh at our good fortune while mourning the rest of the world. And then Jack fires his gun and the screen goes dark. Author's Note Sometimes all a story needs is a little bit of inspiration and a little more perspiration and a helpful dash of serendipity. The inspiration for this one began with the gift of a Tupac Shakur biography from its author, a friend of mine, as well as my odd love for disaster movies. How would Tupac have dealt with the end of the world, I wondered. The perspiration came from researching the rare but terrible disease F.O.P., Fibrodysplasia africans progressiva, which slowly turns a victim's muscles and ligaments to bone. The serendipity came from reading about the Tupac Amuru Shakur Foundation headquarters in Stone Mountain, Georgia. It's not a particularly hopeful story, except for the strength of the human spirit. Whatever disasters befall us, somehow we endure. Okay, welcome back, everybody. I hope you liked the story. Now, after the story, the cast list. You couldn't sell it, could you? (laughs) Even we wouldn't be that lame. (laughs) Okay, but we are going to do a cast list, though. So, Juliet Bowler played our main character, Silent Susan, and also did the voice of Tipsy Tina. What about Randy Rita? What about Sir not appearing in this film? Big Anklevich played Jumpin' Jack! The Dream Maker. <laughs> I hope you wouldn't go there. But I secretly d- was delighted when you did. <laughs> Rich Girardi played Lazy Lamar and Crazy Chris. And Rish Outfield played the State Trooper. 
What about uh, incontinent Irving or <laughs> flaccid Frank? Oh, Nothing like none of those? No, those are, again, sir, not appearing in this film. This story was produced by Rich Girardi, who did a freaking amazing job. It really was uh, something else. So thanks a lot to everybody who uh, participated in today's show. Yeah, Rich kicked our butts on this. And by that, I mean... He had this sucker done uh, so fast. This was scheduled to be in like June. I'm yeah, not kidding. It was. And Rich was like, oh, I'll have it done this weekend. And I said, hey, dude, pace yourself, please. We don't want you to burn out. And he said, okay, by Tuesday, I'll have it done. <laughs> yeah, so here it is. Uh, and I guess we always say produced by, but he also directed it. And by that, I mean he cast the parts and then he told us how he wanted us to do the parts. That's kind of what it That's right. He directed us and directed uh, Juliet instead of us doing that, uh, which normally in a story, uh, most stories, we're the narrator or the main character. So, you know, we are always the ones just, oh, why don't you do it this way? Or why don't you do it that? So we're the directors, s- sort of. Right. Do it exactly the way <laughs> I did it just Right. Now. But uh, yeah, in this case, obviously we weren't the narrator. Owing to the whole first-person female thing, we just can't pull that off. Not anymore. Yeah, Juliet did an amazing job in the story. Thanks, Rich. Thank you much. Do you like doing this cast list thing, or do you think we should abandon it? Because it does create the headache of, okay, who did what? Are we forgetting anybody? Who should be first and second (laughs) and all that? I should always be first. We don't need to worry about that as far as the headache goes. Beyond that, well, who, no. who gives a crap? Anklovich starts with an A. There you go. <laughs> Do you have a sincere answer or you, should we just move on? Um, I like it. I think it's cool. I like it much better when you can find out who did what. Because a lot of times you don't know. You know what I mean? Especially with someone as wildly talented as Rish Outfield who can be so many different voices in one story that you might be like, who did that? I don't know. And be confused. And then, of course, there's folks that make small appearances on the show. Or sometimes, you know, there's somebody's voice where you've heard it a hundred times. And then all of a sudden, in this story, you can't tell that that's that person at all. Like, I don't know if you remember that story way back when that we did. The final exam, I believe it was called, where Liz did the voice of the alien and then she put a whole bunch of effects and stuff because the voice was supposed to be coming out of a translator box or whatever and uh, i had no idea it was liz and it wasn't until in the comments where she uh owned up to that that i went whoa and so you know it's cool to be able to find that out beforehand all right um so i think we should keep with it i don't know what do you think well i'm one of those guys that likes to sit through the credits of movies one of those i think there's three of us left on the planet and, and most of it is just at some point you'll see a, a somebody and be like, I, who is that? Who, who? Or you'll hear a voice or something like in an animated film. You're like, who did yeah. the voice of the queen? I, I know who that is. And that and you can sit through. You can listen to the music or you can sometimes they have outtakes. or Especially these days, a lot of times they'll make special things just for those three of you who sit through the credits and you wouldn't know about nick fury had you not sat through the credits Uh, so i'm one of those uh supporters of the whole cast list thing i mean i even like uh picture credits movies almost never do that anymore but just the acknowledgement and seeing all the names and stuff sometimes it can be excessive Uh, i know there are movies where you know it's like seven minutes for the credits or something but (laughs) well all those people worked on it i suppose right and their families and they are looking for their name and gosh, imagine how many hours of work they put on it. And then, you know, there's their name for a split second right. among a hundred others it's, in the same department. They get so little credit as it is that you've got to at least give them that. Oh, of course, they get a check, too. And that's always nice as well. But I know what you mean. I, I, uh, I have a friend that uh, I knew in college that works for Pixar now. And I completely lost touch basically with this guy. Although a few years ago I found out that he started on with Pixar. So now every time I go to a Pixar film, I'm always looking for his name in the credits. Uh, I found it in The Incredibles. But since then I have a hard time because, you know, there's so many stinking names that go <laughs> Well, also when they've got stuff to entertain you during the credits, you watch that rather yeah, than the names. right. Okay, so uh, Tupac Shakur and the end of the world. Yes. Sandra McDonald uh, seems to have quite a resume. Yeah. How is it 
we are doing this story. <laughs> well, I read the story in Futurismic and I loved it. And so I sent her an email and asked, hey, can we do this story? And she was uh, happy to oblige. I was stoked because, yeah, you know, I read the story and I really, really wanted to do it on the show. So uh, I'm glad that uh, we were able to get it. No, I am too. I, I think that's great when you find a story elsewhere and, and you ask for it. And I've done it a couple of times, though, and uh-huh. not as much. And I hope that she likes what we did with it. But really, it was Rich Girardi's ball game on this right. one. He edited it and he put all the sound effects under it. He did a really amazing job. And as far as I know, he had never produced for us before. No, he hadn't. I think he's got experience doing that kind of stuff. I know that he works in theater, I think. But he also, and we've, we've had him on the show doing voices for us before but uh he also has a puppet show that you can is go that to. a euphemism sir it is not a, it is an actual puppet show oh okay that you can see on youtube that he does uh his show is called lady jade's lair and you can go and check that out too he actually makes these puppets himself they're really muppet looking guys they follow that same kind of style I think they're really interesting. So uh, I would recommend everybody go over and check it out. Uh, There'll be a link in the show notes so you can check it out. But it's on YouTube, have you already said? Yeah, it's on YouTube and he also has his own site. I think that you can uh, see the videos embedded there as well. Well, yeah, it's really cool. I've watched a couple of them. They're they're funny. Uh, You are way more into the Muppets than I am or or you were as as a young and, and all that stuff. Uh, I remember when the Muppets had like their 20th anniversary or something like that. They showed how the the Muppets originally were. And it was for adults. And it was really, really funny and, you know, grown-up humor and all that stuff. And then later they became more child-centric. Yeah, I think once they hit Sesame Street, you know, they had to uh, clean it up. Yeah, the fan still gets hit when, you know, Katy Perry comes on and stuff like that. (laughs) But uh, the Lady Jade's lair strikes me as how the Muppets originally were, how they were meant to be, you know. Yeah, it's not a kid's show. It's not a a goofy, uh, you know, they're not teaching you the ABCs. And there's still uh, always a little bit of that holding out in Muppet movies and in Muppet TV show. One day out of the blue, my wife decided to buy the Muppets. Season three. Was it season three? And I, I, I still am blown away by the fact that Alice Cooper was uh, one of the guests on there. I guess it wasn't necessarily just for kids or, or I don't know. I mean, they kind of still, I mean, they had Muppets dancing around singing uh, Welcome to My Nightmare. I think I probably mentioned this on the show mm-hmm. before, but yeah, it still just blew me away because, yeah, in my mind, I still think of the Muppets as being for kids, but they're not 100%. You watch some of those old, especially the earlier Muppet movies. They have a lot of really adult jokes that I suppose just fly right over uh, the children's heads. You know, they've got a new Muppet movie coming out this year. Oh, yeah? And it's one of those akin to the original ones where there's just a buttload of celebrities that, you know, have their little cameo. Oh, yeah? We had a conversation one time while we were driving about your love for the Muppets, and we were hoping that this was successful. I, I don't really have a soft spot in my heart. The Muppet Show was before my time. Mm-hmm. And there are a couple of the characters that I absolutely loathe, and they're the ones that people always latch on to. I I won't name names, but one of them goes, I I wouldn't name names. I never liked Miss Piggy very much either for some reason. But, you know, I guess there's got to be a character for all different folks. So there's some that some people like and some that other people like. And there's so, the folks that like <laughs> Miss Piggy. I also loathe Animal. And I know everybody loves Animal. So here's that. You know, when I was a kid, we, by chance, recorded on the Muppet movie. It was on TV or something like that. And, you know, we had, it was one of those tapes that we just had sitting around and we would put in and watch. So I probably saw that at least 10 times, probably more like 20 to 30 when I was young. Although... I haven't seen it since, so I've lost most of the memories that I had from that. But I enjoyed that show. I thought it was pretty funny. And I do remember once being taken to the Great Muppet Caper when I was a really little kid and watching that one. And I, uh, they do the things that they do in the Muppets. You know, they're up flying in a balloon during the opening credit sequence. And as people's names come up, they're actually acknowledging that there's names in the sky, which is, you know, is one of those things that usually doesn't happen in movies. And they're like, oh, hey, look at that guy. I always thought that was pretty fun. That's one of the things that I've always loved about Woody Allen movies, too, is when he'll suddenly turn to the camera and say, hey, she said your wife. I mean, you you were there, and and so you saw that, so I'm not crazy. I always love that kind of stuff. 
But yeah, that's one of the fun things about Muppets is that they acknowledge the audience here and there. Break the fourth wall, like I spoke on earlier. So anyways, yeah, Tupac Shakur. <laughs> no, no, no. I think that's cool that you went out and you got this story. And it's very cool that she let us do it. And, uh, you know, if she wants to send us another story, that's great. Thanks to Rich, pretty much. Sandra, if you liked what we did, thanks to Rich. Yeah, you can thank Rich for it. He did a great job. It was interesting, this whole Tupac Shakur story, because when I saw the title, you know, I looked at it and I went, oh, great. This is probably not going to be a story that I like, because I don't like Tupac Shakur. I, I'm not into rap. I want some fries, Yeah, you. I, I can stand it in small doses. I can I can stomach it probably more than you. I'm guessing because I know that that's probably your most hated music genre. I don't despise it, but it's not my thing, so I don't go out looking for it. I think I may have a Tupac Shakur song. Oh, I think he did California Love, which is one of those songs that I liked a lot back in the '90s. Okay, but I think that's it. I know very little about Tupac Shakur, although I think somebody once told me that he was like a background dancer for Digital Underground, I believe was their name. The sex Packets people? <laughs> the one that had the, they did the Humpty Dance. <laughs> I think that's where he got his start, although I could be wrong. I, from what I've heard, if you pay attention in a lot of Bruce Lee movies, you can see Jackie Chan in there as an extra, a young Jackie Chan. So it's fun to see that. It's those kind of goofy side things like that. But yeah, too, you know, I assumed that I wasn't going to like this story when I started reading it. But it's not really about Tupac Shakur in any way. It's barely mentioned. Um, you know, it's kind of a side thing to the whole end of the world that's going on. And I don't know, there was just something about the story. There was a really high emotional content to it. Wraps you up and brings you in and, and toys with your emotions. It, when they did the ending... That really did it for me. You know, they threw in that, the, the fake happy ending <laughs> for you there where Ed Harris and all the scientists come out and they do the stuff. And the, oh, her family is waiting there for it. Oh, my goodness, everything. And then, yeah, then you hear the gunshot. <laughs> oh, I don't know. That just really iced the deal for me. I was like, wow, this is just such a great story that I must. We must do this. Well, cool. I have two Sometimes I'll do this. I'll, I'll tell you, I have two divergent roads of where we could, what we could talk about. Okay. Well, let's take the road less traveled by. <laughs> I have one very, very short anecdote that you've heard before, and then there's, there's the major road where we would be able to talk for another half hour. Okay. Well, I suppose we could do the short anecdote, and then we could go back and get on to the main road. If you think so, but if experience has taught us anything... It's that I will have forgotten what the other one was, or that we'll talk so long about the little short, the road, short road that we won't want to talk anymore. The, yeah, there was one part that really struck me. I, I don't want to say it bothered me, but it reminded me of something that happened. You know the part where she gives her sister this book that she's written oh, about Tupac? Uh -huh. And her sister and says, doesn't... I don't want that in my house uh -huh. where my daughter lives or whatever. Dude, that was so, so, so ugly. <laughs> and it reminded me of when I was a teenager, or I, I, mean, I guess I was in my 20s, I had written this story that I was really, really proud of. Mm -hmm. And I had this roommate that I idolized. You know, I was like, wow, I want to be like this guy. This guy was smooth and popular and successful and confident. And I wanted to be like him. And after I felt like we had become friends, you know, well enough that I said, hey, I, I want you to read my story that I wrote. I've not shared it with anybody, but, you know, I'll, I'll share it with you. And, and I gave it to him. And about halfway through the first page, he handed it back to me and he said, I, I'm sorry, I can't. And I said, what? what? No, we, we've got time or whatever it was. And he's like, no, I, I, I had a bad feeling while reading your story. I, I'm sorry, I can't read it. And he handed it back. <laughs> and it was just devastating to me. And I mean, you know, the actual story, because I've told you before what he actually said. <laughs> but it just was a punch to the stomach. And yeah, that, that may be one of those reasons I don't <laughs> share my work as much as, as, <laughs> as I should, you know, because I, I let my dad read one of my stories, you know, when I was in high school and I never let him read another one all these years <laughs> later. It's just that's all it takes is one person doing that. 
But I mean, I, when, when we got to this part in the story, I just, yeah, it's like, oh, I've got a published book. And I don't know that it was her first published book, but I chose to interpret it that way because uh-huh. it made it all the worse <laughs> right. that the sister was such a bunt about it. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, are we to tea? Can you bleep that, please? Bleep this. All right. Would you bleep what you just said and then what I said as well? <laughs> Did that bother you? Do you remember that part? I do, yes. It's sad that that, you know, can happen. And that that kind of stuff happens all too easily among families where you can say something and sometimes you don't even mean it as being an angry thing or a bad thing. And yet it can, it, you know, it's once it's taken that way, it's really hard to take back. And yeah, so she left town. She was gone. She was not even interested in being around her sister anymore, you know. It took the end of the world to make her want to get back to go and see her again. I totally get that. And it's so uh, upsetting and sad that that people can butt heads like that. But what didn't you write a story and you were so proud of it and it's like holy cow i've finally written a story and it's not just like two pages it's a story and you gave it to your wife and she's like ick <laughs> and i just like oh jeez it wasn't that bad it was no, way worse than that yeah go I, ahead. I was actually in in the midst of writing a story which is way worse to never ever ever share a story with someone until it's finished <laughs> folks Because you don't need to have your ego stroked to keep going. Just go. Keep doing it and finish it first. Because, yeah, I was in the middle of it. I was really enjoying writing the story. I was going along. I was chugging along and and so forth. And uh, I showed up to my wife and she's like, I don't really like this character. He's too nerdy. I'm not really interested in him. And all of a sudden, I was rewriting the story in my head, figuring, okay, how can I make this character more likable? What do I got to do? And so I was planning out all the things that I was going to do to rewrite this story. And of course, I didn't. The story never made it past those pages that I'd written that one time. And I learned my lesson. You know, that's one of those stories that I have been still working on in my head for years. And so eventually, I'll get around to rewriting. You may have heard about it uh, on the show. We've mentioned it probably 20 times or so. It's his magnum opus. (laughs) It's the story about the guy who falls in love with the alien. Or the woman who turns out to be an alien, or <laughs> yeah, something like yeah. unto that, anyways. <laughs> the story we're writing now is the guy that falls in love with the alien. Yeah, You're going to have to change your uh, description from yeah. that. Eventually, I will get back to that. But yeah, that's a lesson that I learned. Don't share it when you're in the middle of it. But yeah, it, it is that way. You know, one comment can make it go back and, oh, God, I got to rewrite this whole thing. I got to change it so that this person likes it. And that, oh, what a bad idea. Well, thank you. If one person had said to Adolf Hitler, I love your painting. Your painting inspires me. (laughs) Oh, he's like, I and my Jewish foundation would like to put this in our lobby, Herr Hitler. (laughs) Imagine how different the world would be. Yeah, there you go. It could have really changed things around. Oh, darn. I I derailed you. Yeah, I lost my train of thought. I I had to say the Hitler thing. Sorry. Rish, you, sir, are worse than Hitler. Um, I think it was Abby Hilton who once... Call this a bunt? Yes. I think it was Abby Hilton who once said that, you know, when you send your story out to get critiqued by people, you need A, to get many people, not just one person, because one person is not a very good sample of what people might think. And uh, the other thing that she was saying, don't change your story because one person says you should change it like this or like that. If you send it out to 10 people and all 10 of them say, hey, you know, I don't like this part or seven or eight of them say that, then maybe you consider revising. But if one person or two people say don't revise over something like that, you know, you wrote it that way and you liked it that way, leave it that way. Just because one person doesn't like it that way, it's not enough. I mean, yeah, that's the same kind of thing. You know, I I let my wife, one person see it and derailed the story. Well, you know what Harlan Ellison said? He said, don't make any changes except for by editorial demand. And then only if you agree. I think (laughs) he was the one that said, then only if you agree. I think it was Heinlein who said, don't uh, rewrite unless for editorial demand. But uh, yeah, I think it was uh, Ellison who says, even then, only if you agree. Screw the editors. They don't know your story. (laughs) That does sound more like Ellison. (laughs) I don't know. I mean, that also sounds like Rich Outfield. So there's that. Does that really? Am I an asshole like Carolyn Ellison? <laughs> no, but wow. uh, you you are the person who uh, 
will stick up for your story to the very end. I've learned that from experience, so. I guess, but I'm never going to do another story after the one. I mean, <laughs> I'm I'm broken, man. I was like, that's it. F every single one of them. <laughs> does that sound like me too? I hope so. <laughs> that does, yes. Okay. okay we so took the road less traveled by. Now let's go back to the main road. What is the main road? Oh, I just wanted to talk about the bleak, unhappy ending. Uh-huh. Because now, ha have we talked about unhappy endings before on the show? I think we have. A time or two. Have we really? We've mentioned uh, how it takes nads to go that way when uh, you know that that may upset your readers or... Uh, it's been my experience that a well-drawn character or a character that I've invested a lot of time and effort into, maybe a lot of lifeblood, I start to feel for these characters. I start to feel like they're people. I start to like them. And it becomes more and more difficult to see them suffer, to see them die. You want there to be happy ending. Mm -hmm. Even if maybe your first intent was, will they die or they suffer forever or bad luck's going to befall them for the rest of their lives – it starts to become tempting. No, I'm going to change that. I'm going to let the I, I'm going to let the geek get the girl. I'm going to let ha the happy ending come out of nowhere. And to me, it's really difficult to say no. This is an unhappy ending. It's supposed to be an unhappy ending, and I always think in terms of movies more than in stories because I'm illiterate. But <laughs> you know, there's just so few truly unhappy endings that you'll get in movies. Because they know that it turns a large percentage of the audience off or, the, right. you know. We're so spoon-fed, especially in America, to have everything turn out fine. They have the fairy tale ending because movies are escapism. You know, movies are something right. you go to, you know, at the end of a long day of unhappiness and injustice to see justice done, to see the good guy, the nice guy finish first. And so the few movies that trickle out there with the, the unhappy ending, with the bleak, the sad, the frightening, the shock endings – People remember those endings forever. They do. And it's just kind of amazing to, to talk about it, to find out, like Pretty Woman originally had an unhappy ending, if you recall. I didn't you know, know and that. He kicked her to the curb and he says, you're a whore. I did not know that. Did you know that, Ed? And test audiences disliked that so much that they tapped on the charming ending that it has. The, you know, she rescues him right back ending. And it became a huge, huge hit. Yeah. I mean, today's dollars. <laughs> but, you know, you'll get something like Seven, which in my mind is the, the greatest unhappy ending of film, or something like Dr. Strangelove, something like Night of the Living Dead, something like uh, The Last American Virgin, which is the second most awful bleak ending imaginable. <laughs> the butterfly effect... Or was that just the uh, director's cut? That the director's the... cut had the unhappy ending. There was a somewhat maudlin ending. Theater, theatrical cut was that way. See, I only saw the director's cut on that one. I saw it on DVD, so. Okay, well, it's difficult to come up with them because, I mean, even in horror movies, and that's something we've I know we've talked about on the show, where it's like if there's any genre where it's okay for the bad guys to win or if it's okay for the world to come to an end or if it's okay for the girl to get butchered or whatever it is, <laughs> it's a horror movie. And even in horror movies, they're like, oh, no, no, no. It's got to be the last girl and she's got to defeat the guy and then you right. got to leave the door open for a sequel, but he still has to be destroyed. Yeah, I know I've talked about that count times on the show why uh -huh. why if it's a horror movie and you have to keep the villain around anyway for your countless sequels <laughs> if it was a japanese horror movie it probably ended badly you're damn right mentioning japanese movies you know that's kind of a thing in i don't know if it's all asian cultures or if i know that japanese are kind of famous for that the tragic ending is much more prevalent in their stuff than it is in western films so maybe it's kind of a cultural thing that we want to see the happy ending more than we want to see the other. There's Inception. It seems it's kind of like this one, I guess, where it seems like it's a happy ending. Everything works out. And then they leave you totally hanging where he's there. He's with his kids and he spins his top. And they cut away before you ever see it topple. That's open to interpretation. Whereas Tupac, that's not a happy ending. Right, right. I'm just saying it's kind of similar where the, it, it could be a fake happy ending on the end of Inception. Or maybe it's real. Who knows? Um, we never get to see because they cut. And that's a really interesting way to go. I really liked the, the fake happy ending of this one. Because, you know, she kept mentioning the various folks and, and then they all show up in the end. Ed Harris is there and his team of scientists, etc. 
I don't know. It really worked for me for some reason. No, it does for me too. And I particularly liked, he, she would mention actors and she would mention movies and stuff throughout just because that's sometimes how I imagine things too. Right. That's how my mind is. And I go to someplace new and I think about movies I've seen that takes place there or in that situation. <laughs> and maybe everybody does it. When you take a trip to Denver, you think about things to do in Denver when you're dead. And I never actually saw that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Me neither. I died first, it turned out. But there'll be things for me to do there. You've been to Denver. We yeah. went together. Yeah, that, was, that was a stupid joke. And I hallucinated a, an elk in the road or something like that. And I guess it's a hallucination because <laughs> you said, no, there wasn't nothing there. <laughs> so big, you're sleeping. <laughs> I did dream uh, some pretty good dreams on the way back, though. We'll never do that again. I, I, I want to do that again. Not, we're not doing a one-night thing like that again. We'll no. never have to do that again, I guess. But. No, we will never drive back the second the concert is over. <laughs> yeah, I was so dedicated to that damn job that I was like, yeah, we'll just drive back and I'll go straight to work from dropping you off. God forbid I'm late for work. <laughs> yeah, they kicked me to the curb as fast as they possibly could have. But you, we were talking about road trips before we started recording, and now we've got a story. If we had just gone and gotten a motel room and then come back the next day or whatever, we probably wouldn't remember that trip at all. It would be less of a story. I think we might remember it in a more positive light, though. Oh, really? No, I... Maybe we just need to walk to Denver, like these people were trying to walk to Florida to really have a good story. This was good stuff, man. I appreciate you picking it. Thank you. I don't know. Maybe we don't need to talk about unhappy endings. Oh, well, here's one more thing, though, before we go. Okay. You, and I. Uh, this I've said on the air before, but you know what? We've got 100 episodes done. It's okay if we repeat ourselves, I think. Here and there. You are really good at the unhappy ending. You know, just you just, you don't give a crap. You know, it's like, yeah, his three-year-old daughter falls into a threshing machine. <laughs> no tears for you. And I was like, whoa, dude. Uh, you don't pull your punches at all, and... I don't know if your mind just works that way or it doesn't bother you in the way that I was just saying before about, you know, you're just like, no, no, I like this guy too much. I know he's supposed to die, but how can I get him to not die? But yeah, almost all of your stories just have a Last American Virgin ending. <laughs> that was okay, not, not that bleak. The child will accidentally blow his head off with his dad's gun, which he's using to defend the last can of gasoline in the whole block. You know, it's not as bad as the last American Virgin. <laughs> as I've gotten older, I'm less inclined to the bleak ending that I've uh, written in the past. I think I feel like I need to find some way to, to find an ending to make it work. Like that story that we spoke of earlier about the guy who falls in love with the woman and it turns out to be an alien. I had the bleakest ending. And I think I told you about it. And you're like, what the f and oh you he bleeps thank you <laughs> you know you, you were just like there's no way i i will ever read that story that is the i will kill myself at the end of that story did i really say and this so thing? And <laughs> i really liked that part though but i had to figure out some way to give it some sort of a positive spin and that's one of the things that i've been working on with that story in my but head for years you don't have to i'm not editorial demand <laughs> and if you disagree then go ahead and do that bleak ending yeah therein lies the power that you are willing to i mean like the ending of pet cemetery or the ending of the shining or one of those where it's like wow you know he he went there uh-huh and that makes those stories really uh powerful yeah thinking about john grisham i've let, read a lot of john grisham books and one of the ones that I remember the ending the most of, The Partner, it leads you all along to expect that there's going to be a happy ending. And then right at the end, he pulls the rug out from under you. Mm. And it turns out, no, not so happy after all. Screw you all. And yeah, you know, I really remember that ending of all the books of his that I read. Because of that, I think, the sad, the... Uh, Tear jerking, the bleak ending, it can really have some power to it. I really enjoy that there is at least that option. You know, we've mentioned it, I think, before when we talked about TV shows where these shows continue on and on and on. And then here and there, they'll have an episode where it just ends badly. And it, I think Battlestar Galactica really bounces out as a good example to me where, you know, here and there, they'll take a character you've dealt with for months and months of this show and then wham 
they'll just murder that character right before your eyes and uh doing stuff like that every now and then it raises the stakes on your story you don't just go oh yeah well they're all, i mean of course they're gonna win i mean why would we even have this story if they're not gonna win of course will smith is gonna defeat the aliens of course he's will smith and and, and then they're aliens they're not gonna win but uh you know when there's a crushing defeat then you have to watch every show wondering is this again going to be the week when they get crushed or is my favorite character going to make it next time you don't know and it makes the show that much more powerful so but the guy that does this the best you know what i'm gonna say right that joss whedon does this so so wonderfully and it wouldn't be our show if we didn't mention firefly who knows how long those nine characters would have all survived had he been able to make that show. But you know, eventually there would have been an episode where it's like, oh, geez, Kaylee was my favorite. And that's what Joss will do because I guess he was raised on television and he says, you know, why doesn't somebody, you know, why doesn't somebody kill Bo or Luke? (laughs) They replaced him with the damn cousins. Oh yeah, that was terrible. Tell me, do you know the name? Come on, give me the names of the cousins. Oh, I don't know the cousins. Oh, their names were Vance. And coy. Oh, okay. It doesn't get any better than this. <laughs> I don't know. It just uh, that, that's something that I love so much about him in his TV. It's just mm-hmm. the the killing off of these beloved characters, and it does make you think this guy will do anything. Mm-hmm. I mean, is all of Buffy is really just a fantasy in a crazy girl's mind. This guy will do anything. <laughs> <laughs> that that's something that I would hope that I would be strong enough to do if I had a show. And there are movies, and it's usually franchise movies where you know everybody's going to be fine. Right. Sometimes it's because of who the target audience is, and sometimes it's just because of the nature of these stories. And if you know from the very beginning that everybody's going to make it out, danger loses its edge. Suspense loses its edge. You know, that's that's a lesson that a lot of filmmakers and, and probably writers can take to heart. Yeah, you have is, to learn it. Sometimes you got to go there. Don't go there. You don't want to go there too often because, you know, there was, there was a, a period where... My wife kept renting films for us to watch, and every time she picked the bleakest, most depressing film, she's like, I thought that you would like this one. It's it's a uh, indie film. Uh, you're into that stuff, right? It's uh, about two cousins that starved to death in a concentration camp. Yeah, I thought but, you might like that one. It's about this guy who's gone crazy because his wife was killed in the Twin Towers, and, you know, we'd watch him suffer for two hours. Isn't that great? And yeah, for a long time, every movie she got was that way. And the next time she's like, hey, you want to watch a movie tonight? We can go rent something. I'm like, "Uh, you know, uh, I think I'm just going to turn in. I'm really tired. And I'd go get in bed and just stare at the ceiling for four hours. Because, you know, I wasn't tired at all. But I anything but watch another one of those films. She's banging on the bedroom door. (laughs) Both of these kids got cancer at the same time. Come on. So you can't do it too often. You've got to temper it with some happiness or nobody's going to want you around. You're like, you'll are like you be like that Debbie Downer at the party where everybody's just like, oh, yeah, well, I'm going to go talk to that uh, really annoying, completely drunk guy that's probably going to vomit on my shirt. That'll probably be more fun. Everything has to come with moderation, I think. But yeah, if you don't ever go there, then you have no power to tell your story. You're, you're, you're weak. Your powers are weak. Hey, Big, you remember a few weeks ago when I was a contestant on that online game show? Oh, yes, I do remember that. Well, the tables have turned. They have? And now you are the fool. And Okay, I'm sorry, I've got nothing. You have appeared on the Guru Showdown, the, the game show. Yes. As a contestant. I appeared and then sadly I disappeared somewhere in the middle of the show. Mm. Yeah, that was it was actually a lot of fun. I, I really enjoyed it. I think the episode that I was in, I'm pretty sure it's, it's episode six or episode 106, because I believe that means season one, show six. Really? They, they're expecting to have more than one season? Uh, cool. <laughs> Great. That, that keeps it straight. Hey, they can have as many seasons as they want. It's not like they need to be renewed by Fox or something. But yeah, it was a lot of fun. I got on there and I took on the gurus. And it, it was pretty cool. 
you, you pick four gurus you get to take on and there's five to choose from. And I, I learned a lesson from your experience with the uh, video game guru. And I thought, you know what? I don't know crap about video games. And so I went with the food guru because you eat. I do. Food. I eat a lot of food. I eat food every day. Whoa, no. Come on. Really? No, you're selling yourself short here. I, I don't go a couple of hours, it turns out. You know, I, I usually eat at least every four hours, pretty much. Okay, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> so I thought that I might have a chance, but turns out, yeah, that was, that was where I got whooped the worst, was by the food guru. How'd you do on the history geography? I, I thought I would have done better with that guy. The, the way it went was the first guru I took on was uh, Lizanne Hurd, who's on our show often. The animal guru the animal guru yes and dude she has so much arcane knowledge she does animals i can't even say the word at one point during the show she says yeah i feel like an animal rain man here (laughs) because yeah she was like that she just yeah pleistocene era yeah definitely definitely not an aardvark definitely pleistocene yeah it was interesting, but I actually, I don't know if I just got lucky or what the deal was with that, but I actually did fairly okay. I, obviously, I'm only on show number six, so it's not like they've faced down hundreds of contestants, but I don't think anyone's even given Liz a run for her money yet. Because you're supposed to get seven points, I think, to win. Mm-hmm. I'm the closest I think probably anybody's ever come is like two or three. Because <laughs> the questions that are in the animal section are fairly difficult. I think I must have just got lucky because I actually had five points and twice I picked the two-point question that would have won the game, but unfortunately they were not two-point questions that I won. So I did not conquer over Liz. The animal rain man beat me again. It's too bad because, you know, I may not be an animal guru, but I am a manimal guru. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> What's the name of the guy who played Manimal? He passed away recently. Simon McCorkendale, I think, was his name. And uh, we lost a hero of three when That's he right. passed away. We, our, our community has been diminished greatly from his passing, yes. <laughs> Dr. Jonathan Chase, wealthy, young, handsome, a man with the brightest of futures, a man with the darkest of pasts. From Africa's deep recesses to the rarefied peaks of Tibet, heir to his father's legacy and the world's darkest mysteries, Jonathan Chase, master of the secrets that divide man from animal, animal from man. Manimal. 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 Um, so then the secondly, I took on the uh, Name That Tune Guru, which was really enjoyable. That's one of those things that I love doing. I, and we do that every now and then. Like the other day, you just over the IM, you're like, hey, let's both listen to the Jack FM stream and uh, we'll see who can name the tune that comes up first. And that was fun too. I, I'm sure this anecdote is not going to get me laid. Thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. I, I thought it was fun too. And typing as fast as we can. Right. Like Boston, more than a fee. Oh, he's already sent it. Yeah, you know, as the songs would play, because, you know, you have to wait for the next one to come on. I'd be like, eh, doing whatever, and then it gets near the end of the song, and I'm like <laughs> poised over the keyboard, ready to go, because I enjoy that kind of crap. And I'll do that to my wife, who I'm pretty sure absolutely despises it. You were poised over her with your hands like that? Well, <laughs> yes. I have heard she, she despises she it. She doesn't like that. No, every time a song will come on the radio, I'll be like, hey, who sings this? She's just like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't you open the door and jump out of the car, please? But I really dig on doing Name That Tune. But when we were messing around doing that over the Jack FM, like the song comes on and you're like, oh, this is The Tubes. Uh, she's a beauty. I'm like, holy crap. If you know that much and you're not even the Name That Tune guru, I'm screwed because The Tubes, I've never even heard of that band ever. So yeah, I, w- I was actually a little fearful. And... To tell you the truth, it started badly because they, they're like, okay, you're first big. Here's your first tune. And they put on this tune and it played for a while and there wasn't even lyrics in it. And it gets to the end and I'm like, oh, I've never heard of that. I'm just, I'd like to use my first lifeline. Can I call my dad and ask him if he knows this song? I guessed that it was Benny Goodman because I'm pretty sure somebody was playing a oh, clarinet. Was that old? No, it turns out it wasn't because I said that and he's like, well, you're about 20 years too early. There's some song from the 60s and he said the name of the band and I could not recall the name of the band. Okay. You could point a gun at my head and I've never ever heard this song or this band or anything like it. But uh, in the end, that was the one guru I was able to defeat. By the end of the first two rounds, I had 12 points, and I was stoked. I was thinking, holy crap, 
I'm kicking butt. I'm going to do great. Mm. And then the food guru came next and she dispatched me without further comment. It was just like one, two, three, boom. It didn't last long. I did manage to get one point in that round. And the question was very much a one point question. <laughs> You had to be a, almost a complete imbecile to not get it right. Although I was afraid it may have been a trick question, and I almost went for something else, and it was close. Well, do you know if Liz is still looking for contestants? Yes, she is. They're always looking for contestants. And so if you'd like to check it out, try it out. Send them an email. Because I think every two weeks they get together, they get their whole crew together, and they hang out, and they do several shows. They'll have a couple of contestants so they can have some for each week. And I, and I think... Show 105 was the first time that they had a duo, a combination, a Marvel team-up version of the show where they had two contestants taking on the gurus. So they want uh, something like that. They actually tried to get me and Rich to do that. And unfortunately, when they asked us, our schedules didn't coincide. And so we were we wound up having to do it separately. I think that was for the best, though. Yeah, that's probably they fine. They got two episodes out of it. Yeah, they there got you go. two promos out of it too. That way, Marvel Team Up was a showcase for what character? Spider Man. Probably that would have been a two point question, huh? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. They had a comic book guru. Yeah, I tried to tell them that you wanted to volunteer to be a guru, but they said, "F that." Who? Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I think we're having trouble with the Skype call, and then yeah, it was disconnected. So. There's that. Okay, well, hey, is that episode up right now? The one with you? It is. You can swing on over there and listen to it. Okay, so it's called Guru Showdown at guruShowdown.com and uh, listen to Big uh, Triumph <laughs> over the... Yeah. So it, they, they do the name that tune as the final round every time or, or they have a different final round sometimes? The final round is whoever you manage to defeat. When you face each guru, you face the four, and if you defeat any of them, you get to face them in a final round. Hmm. I don't know if anyone's ever defeated two gurus at once. Well, they probably would let them choose then. Yeah, maybe they let them choose, or maybe they let them do both. I don't know. But uh, yeah, I, I did manage to defeat the uh, Name That Tune guru, so I had a final round against her, and I blew it. I had a chance to be a real contestant. What did I do? You blew it! Yeah, just a bummer. I was pumped about it, too, because they came up. And you get, like, all the points. If you win the final round, you get all the points that the guru said and the ones that you said. They started up, and they're like, okay, uh, we have a list that has 40 items on it. You know, you guys each just name an item from this list. And uh, if you win, contestant, then you get all the points from the guru and yours. And you can keep going until you get one wrong. And I thought, totally kill Rish's score with this. Mm -hmm. Because that's where most of my points came from. Right, because you can't, I mean, 40, if I could have named all 40 items, can you imagine if I'd come away with a 60 for my score instead of a 15? It's just one of those bummers. I, I think the same thing happened on your final round when you did it, except for that with yours, it was the guru who blew it. On the first question. <laughs> yeah. It was a bit of a bummer. Well, who knows? Maybe they'll have us back. They might, yeah. That would be fun. Or maybe, I mean, shoot, I think... Up until they recorded our episodes, you still had the highest score. And they say at the end of every uh, episode, yeah, whoever at the end, we're going to invite back the contestants with the highest scores to play for a major award. I think they're going to send you that that lamp with the, the <laughs> with leg the lamp stocking, <laughs> with the fishnet stocking to you if you win. Okay, we'll let, we'll have people check that out. Yeah, go and go and check it out. And if you want to be a contestant, send them an email because it's it's a lot of fun. There's no reason not to do it. I guess that kind of brings us to the end. But but before we go, before we go, we're going to kill off a long running character. Announcer man, come here. I've got, I've got <laughs> something I want to show you. If you say so. <laughs> All right, never mind. Just okay. go have a smoke break. We we're gonna I see, I can't do it. I looked into his big, old, non-existent eyes, and I just, oh. How could you? <laughs> and now, a word from our sponsor. Hey, Big, do you remember a long time ago when we were sent a promo to do for a library event? Oh, yeah, I do remember that. I think we finished the promo and put it on the feed like a week after the library event had passed. That was one of our finest hours. <laughs> Yeah, see, if announcer man were alive today, I would welcome him <laughs> saying you two were nominated for a Parsec, but alas. Alas. So, oh, so I guess what we were getting around to is we have a chance to redeem ourselves. <gasps> Hooray. 
All right. It was all your fault. I'll just put it forth now since you're showing me your tood. That's probably true. And uh, run with it. Okay. So the uh, event is, this isn't just at your run-of-the-mill library either. (laughs) We're not talking just the Springfield branch of the library. We're talking the Redding Library. We're not talking Redding, California here either. We're talking Redding, okay, hold on. Berkshire, right? <laughs> Berkshire happens to be in one of those fancy countries across the pond. Like Guam. Yes, or the Canary Islands. No, it's actually in England. It is an island, though. So there's that. No man is an island. That's true. <sighs> Should we start again? <laughs> Maybe. Reading Central Library. Oh, Reading Central Library. This is the main library in Reading, not reading, which, gosh, how can you have something spelled reading and a library, but yet you pronounce it Reading instead? That really seems like an opportunity missed there. So in the Reading Central Library on Wednesday, April 13th, from 6 p.m., <laughs> not to anything in particular, I guess. No, until the wee, wee hours. <laughs> Forever. Till starts, Miriam finally throws everyone out. Starts at, at 6 p.m. There will be a special appearance of Jonathan Downs. Yes, this is the return of the Monster Hunter. See, Jonathan Downs was there before. You had a chance, but if you missed it... You had a chance to see Jonathan Downs the Monster Hunter, and you blew it! That's right. You blew it, so now it's your chance to redeem yourself, like we're trying to redeem ourselves now, by getting this done before April 13th. He's going to appear. This guy is the director of the Center for Fortean Zoology. Do you know what that is, Mr. Rish Outfield? Fortean Zoology? If I had to guess, Alex, I would say... What is the study of supernatural, mythical, questionable species? That sounds like a good guess. Unfortunately, you're incorrect. Am I? Uncorrect, which is much, much worse. It's the fatal version of incorrect. Unfortunately, you're incorrect. It is the uh, study of butt cancer. Oh, shoot. What's something funnier than that? (laughs) Wait. St. Mary's Butt Sand Church. Nice. <laughs> the study of St. Mary's Butts. I was going to wish he had more than one, sir. <laughs> Apparently, St. Mary's Butts is in Reading. No, no, I, I knew a guy who was a, uh, a member of the Center for Fortean Zoology. It was um, Connor Chodesworth. Oh, yeah, I remember that guy. He was kind of a douche. That far, I kind just chode. But. Okay, chode might be a better name for it. Yeah, I, I just remember him complaining about every time we'd say a sentence, he'd be like, "Yeah, you're using too many words. You don't really need to use that many words to get across your point." Douche. Okay, but uh, what about uh, Jonathan Downs? What do you know about him? He is the director, right? But what has been given us to read about him? Uh, Sir, not Ian McKellen. Would you read this part, please? Whether investigating chupacabras in Puerto Rico, searching for the Mongolian death worm, unearthing Texas blue dogs, sighting lake monsters in Ireland, or tracking alien big cats in Devon, John's recollection of his adventures always provides a fascinating and edifying experience. Thank you, Sir Not Ian McKellen. Yes, that was quite nice. I think that really gave us the right feel that we needed for this particular uh, announcement. If you wanted to go and show up there, uh, I believe it's just a 30-minute train journey from Paddington Station or Fartington Station. It's even closer. (laughs) Hey, that ain't funny, man. My sister-in-law farts all the time. It's really painful. It's only a 10-minute journey from Fartington Station. Just west of uh, London. Swing on down. I believe we do have a few listeners in London that could uh, swing over and check this out. Do we really? Even after that horrendous Ian McKellen impersonation? You think? <laughs> well, we have a few less listeners in London than we had before it. But How, how much are the ticket prices, Big Anchorage? Uh, it says... 
L3 and L2. I, I have no idea what that might mean. Well, if I had to guess, I would be like level three, like, like in age. Okay. Level two. No, no, that doesn't work. It must le be something else. Le le it's kind of a curly large. L, though. Is that something else? Maybe it's a backward two. Yeah, it has a line in the middle of it, too. Like sometimes you put in a Z where you have the line in the middle. Hmm. I have no idea what that might be. But anyways, it's three or two. Of the L's? Hmm. Of the, Yeah, you'll need three or two L's. Oh, I think that means quid. Okay. Do you care to share with the rest of the class how you came to that conclusion? It's a word. But it doesn't look anything like a Q. It looks like an L. It's a word that, that comes from over there. I don't know what it means, though. I think it's it's a money. It's a, it's a shekel. It's a farthing. Okay. It's it's a hay penny. <laughs> All right, so it will be either three or two hay pennies. <laughs> three or two L's you will need to bring. I'm wondering if any of this will actually make the air. Where I hope not. Hopefully we'll have a big I'll puffy be, outtake section. I'll be pretty embarrassed if any of it makes the air. Our, our friend of the show, uh, Miriam, is a librarian at this Reading Central Library. And she is extremely bored with what she does in her day job. And so she's always trying to drum up interest by having these events, these interesting people, interesting signings, interesting, I, I believe there was a public flogging at one time, which they hadn't had in six years in Reading. Yeah. You know, so if, if, if you're in town to see St. Mary's butts, you could... <laughs> and church. Uh, and church, I'm sorry. Sometimes I think St. Mary's butt and church is, uh, but I, it's wrong. Plural, singular. <laughs> Yeah, just swing on by the Reading Central Library and uh, say hi to Miriam. Say hi to uh, Jonathan Downs. Yeah, give a listen to what he's got to say. It's it's going to be some interesting stuff. When you hear this guy's talk, I, I think it'll probably make the adventures of Connor Chodesworth sound like an environmental lecture by Al Gore. So, yeah. Hey, hey, none of you would be surfing the internet if it went for my Al Gore. That's right, I forgot he invented it. Lockbox. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just move on. I, I, she's never going to ask us to do this again. Because, see, in England, you only get two strikes. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. I, I, didn't under, I never have been able to figure out the rules of cricket. Do they even have any strikes? The pitcher's called a bowler. I know that. All right. You, you're just making things up now. <laughs> I can tell. And I think they use a wicket. Or maybe it's a whiffet. The hell? <laughs> Good night. And now it's time to talk about something completely different. That's something I, I, you know, I've been listening to a lot of other podcasts and something they do all the time is we need donations. We pay our authors. But even before the story starts, let me let you know that we pay our authors and we need you to donate to the show. And I don't know why I just I have so much difficulty begging for donations, but I guess you have to do it. So, so, so I'm going to beg for donations Ooh. starting now. Go, folks, please click on the PayPal link and give us a donation. It'll help us pay authors like Sandra McDonald and uh, maintain the site and keep going. Well, recently, we raised our rates, as we mentioned, and we want to be able to continue raising Yeah, well, yeah we'd rates. like to double them another time. That would be cool. Just throw us, if you have the funds available, and if you appreciate the show, it really does help us get together and continue to do this, especially now when it looks like we're going to be weekly, but it would take but a nudge to just push us off of the schedule. It would just take me saying, no, I'm not going to work on it. Or you saying, well, it's, it's late right. next week. <laughs> right? I mean, that's all it would take because yeah. we're tired or we've done. I'm mean, geez, dang. I had like a 10 minute promo that we recorded for somebody the other day. It took over an hour to edit that damn 10 minute promo. How can anything <laughs> take that long? <laughs> Always takes at least three times as long as you think. Sometimes more. So please donate, and uh, we will talk in the next couple of episodes about uh, maybe another uh, reward for those that have. Yeah, we will uh, get going on that. Thanks for listening, folks. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield. See you later. Bye. Thanks for listening to The Dune Steve. The Dune Steve is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can give it to anyone, but you cannot change it or make money off it. What's black holds a microphone and will never know the loving touch of a woman. 
Rish Outfield Soul. Take two. Yeah, give a listen to what he's got to say. It's it's going to be some interesting stuff. It'll make uh, Connor Chodesworth sound like somebody that's boring. <laughs> I can't think of a good comparison. Yeah, we're, we're not, not supposed, supposed to be, to be talking about that kind of stuff. That was supposed to just be a quick aside. Oh, that's all right. When uh, gone am I, you can do the show however the hell you want. Gone you shall be soon. Wait. That's that's it. Spoiler. Oh, oh what a giveaway. Oh. Okay, let me let me do it again. <laughs> oh, maybe I ought to get this person's name up. I don't even know what her friggin' name is. Sandra know. McDonald, I think it is. Sandra McDonald. Yo. Lady Elf Cheem. Sandra McDonald. Today's episode, homie, is Tupac Shakur and the End of the World. Sandra, is it D? Sandra D. McDonald? Look at me, I'm Sandra D, lousy with virginity in our high school production. We had to change that line to such purity, which I'm fine with, but I hate it when Glee does it. <laughs> I hate it when you do it, but I like it when Glee does it. Nice one. I don't do it. You did. You just told me you changed it to purity or whatever the heck. I would change it to vaginosis if it were up to me. Come on. 206 views. How much of the internet is toiling in anonymity? Yeah, but that little shit that just went to the dentist and he's like, whoopee. Millions of views. Millions, dude. More people have seen that little boy go, ah, in the backseat of a car than have ever read a book. <laughs> do we want to do the game show thing now or do we want to do it separate? You know, I, I think the thing that uh the, the real uh when i was a kid uh cut out all my stuttering there and we'll start from when i was a kid when i was a kid we um i think it was abby hilton who once shoot what was it that she said i remember that it was abby that had said something but that our work is fly covered festering shite oh that's what it was okay i think it <laughs> Oh, it's for obfuscation. U-F-U-cation. What did he turn into, Manimal? He could turn into like a panther and a bird of some sort, right? Like, like a, a hawk a, a or something? A raven or something. And, and there was one more, couldn't he? Was there a third? I think there, there were Let's three. Let's see, there's a... Oh, he could turn himself into any animal he chose. Oh, wow. I had no idea. Dr. Jonathan Chase, wealthy, young, handsome, a man with the brightest of futures, a man with the darkest of pasts. From Africa's deep recesses to the rarefied peaks of Tibet, heir to his father's legacy and the world's darkest mysteries, Jonathan Chase, master of the secrets that divide man from animal, animal from man. Manimal. 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 <laughs> now, who's cooler, manimal or beastmaster? <laughs> I don't know. Mark Singer was beastmaster and... <laughs> There's an episode where uh, Pierce comes uh, to the Halloween party as Beastmaster, and, and they're like, who the hell are you supposed to be? And he's like, I'm the Beastmaster. I wanted to be something cool. <laughs> oh, there must have been two Halloween episodes then, I guess, huh? Because no. that was the first year. Second year, he was dressed as a Star Trek guy. Yeah, and he eats something bad, and he's they're like, oh, you're swelling up here. Your costume is getting all too realistic. <laughs> This is getting fatter like all the characters eventually did. Hopefully we'll have a big puffy outtake section with a I'll lot of this crap. Our, our friend of the show, uh, Miriam, is a librarian at this Reading Central Library. And she is extremely bored with what she does in her day job. But she works at a brothel at night, so you know, it kind of evens out. Gosh, we recorded 15 <laughs> minutes of crap. <laughs> The <laughs> poor, poor woman. <laughs> Give us a donation. It'll help us pay authors like Shauna McDonald. Sandra. Sa Sandra McDonald. Old McDonald. Bum, bum, bum. Bum, 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 bum